by sin but nothing but the blood of Jesus is what can make me whole again but nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow Morning, let's stand and sing together. his name forever.
Leaping across the mountains, bounding over the hills, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, peering through the lattice. My beloved spoke and said to me, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. See, the winter is past. The rains are over and gone. Flowers appear on the earth. The season of singing has come. The cooing of doves, the cooing of doves is heard in our land. 
The fig tree forms its early fruit. The blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. Let's lift our hearts together this morning. Father, your invitation to us in Christ is to come and sit. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you'd help us keep our eyes fixed on you through every circumstance that we may be facing in life, even at this very moment. Even in the face of death, we look to you knowing that you alone are our hope, our life, our love, our faith. And God, we pray that you would come quickly. Lord, you are our beloved, and we are loved by you. God, I pray that you would unite us as your church this morning in this body here in Nightdale. Lord, for your church worldwide, we pray that you would help us be united in Jesus Christ through your Holy Spirit. As we sing and as we pray and as we read your word this morning, God, I pray that you would soften our hearts, that we'd be transformed by renewing our minds, and that you'd be glorified in us as your people. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and all the church said, amen. Welcome to Northside Community Church. My name is Eric. I'm the pastor of worship here. If you're visiting with us this morning, we're glad you're here. And, um, and as we continue our time together, I'm just going to ask you to take time to, to greet one another. You can move around the sanctuary this morning and say good morning to everybody, and we'll call us back together and sing in just a few minutes. There's an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. And though the storms may come, I am holding on to the rock I clean. Sing aloud, church. Can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and He makes my Sing when I win, I can sing 
when I lose my stuff and fall down again. I can sing cause you pick me up and sing cause you're there. I can sing cause you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can sing with my last breath, sing for I know. Your love 
never fails, and never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, and never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, and never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, and never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your Never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, you are love. Your love. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Our epistle reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans. This is a peculiar passage because it's one of those things that we all deal with in, uh, in different ways. Um, the things that we want to do, we don't do. And the things that we don't want to do is what we end up doing. And so we're constantly battling this throughout life and trying to figure out our identity in Christ in light of the truth is that we can do nothing apart from it. And so when Paul's writing this to the, to the church in Rome, he's trying to communicate something. If you take the law seriously, if you take doing everything that the law requires seriously, you're going to find yourself in this predicament. That what you don't want to do is what you're going to end up doing and what you want to do, you're not going to be able to do. And so as we think about what life looks like now, you know, everyday life, you know, we get, we go to work, we get angry with somebody, and then we feel bad about ourselves because it's like, man, I'm, I'm supposed to be a Christian, I'm supposed to follow Christ, I'm supposed to be patient and kind and loving, and yet I find myself doing the exact opposite. And so our hope is not set on doing something right. Our hope is in Christ. And at the end of the day, that's what it comes back to. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate here. It doesn't matter what you think you do well. It matters that Jesus Christ is acting on our behalf, doing something that we cannot do. And so as we think about this passage and as we think about a response to it, the song we'll be singing afterwards is called Come Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus is our hope. He is the one person who can take away our sin, the one person who can make things right in our own heart, in our own mind, and in our world. So I encourage you, as you hear the words from Paul being read this morning, that you reflect on maybe how that plays out in your life and what that looks like on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that being means that uh, you haven't been kind this morning to someone, or maybe you failed to do something, or maybe you tried really hard to do something and you keep returning back to the same old thing. Paul says, starting in verse 15 in Romans 7, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing wrong. It is the sinful nature living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life. That when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war within my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God. 
The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let this be your prayer this morning. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come again to claim your own. Come to reap what you have sown. All creation weeps and groans for you. It's to you that we belong. It's to you we lift our song. How our spirits look and long for you. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Like a thief in dead of night, come my everlasting light. Let your brilliance shame the brightest day. With your voice like endless seas, wielding swords and stars and keys, bring the nations to their knees, we pray. As our brother came before us, I, may our hearts remain restless until they rest in you. And Father, we find ourselves this morning in a place unable to do the good things that you called us to apart from you. And so, Father, we are bound by sin without you. We are unable to be free from it. But God, our encounter with you 
demonstrates that you love us, for you came to us while we are still sinners. You give us the power to be able to say yes to the Holy Spirit and no to sin. And Father, I pray that you would open our ears, help us to hear your Spirit this morning. Open our eyes, help us to see your Spirit this morning. Father, we love you, but apart from you, we can't love you. So we need you to do the very thing you're calling us to. Lord, we lift up those in our community who are sick this morning, knowing that trials and tribulations have potential to separate us from you. God, we know you're the great healer, the one who sustains us. So we pray that you would sustain them this morning, that you would keep them close, that they would know your heart. That even in prayer, we move your heart. Father, we pray for the church and the leadership. We pray that you continue to guide and direct them in wisdom. We keep our eyes on Christ. Help us to do the work you've called us to, Father. Pray that as we speak through Adrian this morning that we hear your word. You could fashion us into a people created not just in your image, God, but given your likeness in and through Christ. We pray you be glorified in your church this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Eric. If you brought a Bible with you, if you will find John chapter 1, if a phone, tablet, anything that you have to look Scripture up with, we're going to be in the Gospel of John, and we're continuing this series looking at the B team. We started this summer looking at characters in the Bible that if you grew up in church, you may have heard of them before, but chances are we don't spend a lot of time talking about the people we've been talking about so far this summer. We talked about Hagar and how she was an instrument really of, of, of Abraham and Sarah's plan, but how God ended up using her and, and that predicament in her life to show his faithfulness to her. We talked about Gideon and how God had raised Gideon up for a time, a very reluctant general, a reluctant warrior, and God raises him up and, and is sending him to fight the Philistines, and then God continues to winnow down his army to 300 men. We talked about Jonathan and the power of friendship and the power of what it means to have somebody come alongside you and say, I am with you, heart and soul. And this morning, we're going to be talking about a disciple, a disciple that maybe you've heard of before, but chances are he is not, when you think of the disciples of Christ, he is probably not the one that comes to mind most often. We know him as Andrew, and we're introduced to him in this gospel. We're going to be reading verse. 35 through 42. So I invite you to follow along with me as we read this together. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples, and that's a reference to John the Baptist. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. And that is our introduction to this guy named Andrew. Now, by a show of hands, how many of you have ever had something exciting, whether it was a present or something you did, that you just could not wait to tell the person who you had done it for? Anybody? Anybody? Most people in this room, last week I brought a Christmas present for my brother. 
and I, it, there's no way I'll make it to Christmas. I am so excited about what I got him. And I told Shoshana a couple days ago, I'm like, I brought Eric's Christmas present. I've got it. And she's like, Adrian, it's July. And I know exactly what she meant. There's no way she's going to have to still shop for Christmas for them because there is no way that gift is going to last till Christmas. This morning, I was reminded that this does not fall far from the tree in our family. My, my son and daughter, who have been out of town with my parents, was sitting in the, the bathroom with me this morning. I was getting ready, and he was talking, and, and I said, Cole, me and you, we're going to spend this afternoon together. And he's like, oh, okay. And I said, we may go get some ice cream, but it's got to be a secret. And he said, okay, we don't tell anybody, right? And I'm like, that's right, we don't tell anybody. I hear his little feet going off down the hall, out into the living room where our daughter is. Harper, I have a secret. I have a secret. There are so many times where we are told stuff or we see stuff and we can't hold on to it. It doesn't matter if it's something that we've done for someone and we just think, man, I'm more excited about it than they'll be. When I look at Andrew's life, we don't know much about him. But I get this impression that he's one of these individuals that when he sees something, he is instantly mesmerized by it, especially when it is something that he has been waiting for. I will tell you there's a man in the Bible that many of us are familiar with. His name is Simon Peter. Peter was, a, by all accounts, a successful fisherman before he met John the Baptist, before he met Christ, before he became a disciple. And although there were 12 disciples, Peter in Scripture is always listed as the first. And, and you get this impression, even by the other disciples' accounts, that Peter quickly rose through the ranks of the other disciples and was seen as this leader among these other followers of Christ. We know that he was part of the, the inner sanctum with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. We know that Peter was transfigured before Jesus Christ up on the Mount of Olives. We know that Peter went out and preached one of the very first sermons in the early church. We know that Peter was boisterous. We know that Peter went out and tried to walk on the water to get to Jesus. We know that Peter told Jesus, I will die for you. We know that when they were in the garden that Peter took a sword out and cut off Malchus, the high servant of the chief priest's ear. We know that Peter was always this guy who was asking Jesus questions, who was challenging Jesus, who Jesus even referred to as Satan once. Peter was this individual who in Scripture we look at and, and maybe we're even attracted a little bit to how excited he is, to how passionate he is. We even have two books in Scripture that are attributed to Peter. We know that Peter at the end of his life was crucified upside down because he did not feel he was worthy enough to be crucified like Jesus Christ. We, we have this man who many of us who have grown up in the church or many people who haven't grown up the church, they hear, who is the person you think of when you have jokes about heaven? Who is always the one at the gate of heaven that's going to let people in? Saint who? Saint Peter. I mean, we, we know him. Even people who aren't in church know Peter. But the question becomes, who brought Peter to Jesus Christ? When you look at the scripture, it seems to be this indication that Andrew and Peter both were believers long before they met the Messiah. We know that John the Baptist was on the scene and, and John is there. And as, as scripture tells us, John is there to prepare the way. John is there to let people know that this Messiah is coming. He is going to make things right. And there were many people in biblical times that thought John the Baptist was in fact the Messiah. John has to spend time telling him, look, I'm not the Messiah. I'm coming and I'm preparing the way for the Messiah. And two of his disciples, we don't exactly know who the other one is that saw the Messiah that day, but Andrew was one of them. And so the Messiah passes by and John the Baptist immediately recognizes and calls him out and says, Behold, it's the Messiah, the Lamb who's going to take away the sin of the world. And what does Andrew do? Well, Scripture says Andrew immediately starts following him. It tells me that Andrew was waiting with anticipation for Jesus Christ. That he believed John the Baptist. He believed what John was saying about Jesus. And the moment that John the Baptist recognizes who Christ is and recognizes him as the Messiah, 
Andrew, man, he is off and going. And he not only follows Jesus and stays with him all day, Scripture says that he does what? He goes back home and he tells his brother that we have found the Christ. We have found the Messiah. It's amazing to me that we know so much about Peter. And yet you look at who introduced Peter to Christ. And how little we know of Andrew. Do you know Andrew is only mentioned 12 times in Scripture? The only other times he's really referenced in Scripture is when he is asking Jesus about the signs of the ends of the times. He's listed in that conversation. He's always listed in the 12. But outside of that, there's there's really not much more than, than what this passage indicates here that talks about Andrew. Andrew, from what we know, is that he is the brother of Peter. And and having brothers and sisters, sometimes you understand that it's hard living in shadows of those individuals. And and I I can't help but think that Andrew has gotten this reputation in the church of of living in the shadow of Peter. And and yet, I I don't know that we would have Peter if it wasn't for Andrew. I I, I look at Andrew's life and I think, man, I, I want to be that bold that when I recognize Jesus Christ doing something, that I go and I tell people. It's, it's better than a birthday present. It's better than going and getting ice cream. It's better than anything I could come up with, that when I see Jesus, man, I, I'm off to the races to tell people. We know that, that Andrew was a fisherman like his brother. And and by most accounts, that was a a pretty successful business in biblical times. You made a decent wage being a fisherman. You were a hard worker. And and when I read the accounts of of Peter and Andrew and, and the fact that they just dropped what they did the moment they saw the Messiah, it leads me to this question. What would make them drop exactly what they're doing? What would make them drop the family business? What would make them drop... this this income that they had? What would make them drop this notoriety in in the society that they had? That the moment they saw Jesus, all of those things took their priorities and, and found their rightful place in their lives. And Jesus became the most important thing. What would leave, what would, would lead a man or a woman to leave their home, to leave their job? to to leave their security, to leave their future, to follow Jesus. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever considered the people who go off on mission and they leave everything behind to do what they believe Jesus is calling them to do? Or people who who make these big transitions in their life because they feel like Jesus is leading them. And and we step back and we're, we're so amazed at that. Or we see people who go and they share their faith and it scares us because we think we could never do something like that. Or or we see people who are giving of their time and talents in ways that just defy logic at times. And we think, what would possess someone to do that? I I believe there are Christians, and I want you to hear me on this. I, I believe there are Christians who have seen Jesus Christ work in their lives in such a way, and they anticipate him continuing to work, that they could not imagine life without them. And therefore, they are living faithfully for him. And then I think there's people who call themselves Christians who who trust Jesus, who believe in him, but they're not so sure they've ever seen him work. They're not so sure they've ever seen him do anything. And so their relationship with Jesus is one that is very casual. It's more like an acquaintance type relationship than it is, I'm going to live and if necessary, die for this person. The reality is, is that many of us might think, Adrian, you've told us all these great things about Jesus. Why wouldn't someone like Peter or Andrew follow him? And I'm I'm here to tell you today, I mean, Jesus is the same person. And so why is it that at times we as Christians who profess Christ won't follow Jesus? Why is it that at times when we feel him working in our heart, we push it away and we say, I'm not ready for that right now. I don't want to do that right now. I'm not talking about leaving your job. I'm not talking about leaving your family. I'm not talking about giving up your future. What I am talking about are in the day-to-day things of life, what is the most important thing to you? 
If we were to pull one of your friends aside, somebody who knows you really well, and we were to ask them, what is the most important thing to John? What is the most important thing to Fred? What is the most important thing to Susan? What would your friend say is the most important thing? When I look at people like Peter and Andrew, I can't help but think that their friends would have said the Messiah is the most important thing. Those guys would have never left their job if it wasn't for the real deal. Those people would have never gotten off the couch if it wasn't for the real deal. Those people would have never missed Grey's Anatomy if it wasn't for the real deal. There's all kinds of things that we're drawn to in this life. And yet Jesus is perhaps the one that is most powerful to draw us away from them. Jesus is so big that you have to hold on to him with two hands, and yet many of us are holding on with one. And we've got the world in our other hand, and at times the tug of the world is so much more powerful than the tug of Christ. I would ask you, is he the most important thing in your life? And if he's not, if you're honest enough to answer that question, if he's not, then... Are you prepared to do anything about that? So many people as a pastor and even as a hospital chaplain, I, I get this question a lot. How do you really follow Jesus? I mean, it's not like Jesus is in the sky or, or he's a cloud and you just march in this direction or you, you go in that direction. How do you really follow Jesus? How do you learn to take all the stuff that we build our lives around in Scripture and, and put it in its rightful place? And the reality is that if you're honest with yourself, every single one of us has this deep longing that cannot be fulfilled outside of Jesus Christ. We try to fill it with all kinds of things. We try to fill it with the latest trip or, or the latest promotion or, or the latest addiction. We try to fill it with all this stuff of the world and this longing of our heart that isn't fulfilled is just a continual reminder that those things are in the wrong place. It's not that they're bad. It's just that they're not going to bring the peace that Jesus Christ can bring. They're not going to bring the joy and the life abundant that Jesus Christ can bring. Too often we hear that voice and we try to fill it with so many things. The latest gadgets, the latest technology, a new relationship. And yet there's this continual longing in our life simply reminding us that our heart is really crying out for intimacy with Jesus. To see the Messiah and to say, we have found him. There are results that show if a person's had an encounter with Christ. There are things, much like a person who loses weight, much like a person who has found their, their lifelong love, much like a person who is at joy and at peace in their life, there are indications of when a person has encountered Jesus. Much like Andrew hearing and seeing, I have found the Messiah, and I'm going to leave John, this one that I've been following. I'm going to leave him, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to hang out with this Jesus guy all day. And after I get out hanging, done hanging with him, I'm going back, and I'm telling my brother, we have found the Messiah. There are indications in life that tell us whether a person is walking with Jesus or not. And so if you're taking notes this morning in your outline, I've got these listed for you. Here's the first one, and this is so important. It's self-denial. Jesus Christ says, if you want to follow me, you have to do what? You have to pick up your cross and follow me. Our crosses are all different. They're, they're crosses, they look different. Even if you go back to biblical times, you had crosses that look different. And I think it is symbolic of the crosses that are in our life. I don't know what your cross is. I know what mine is. And there are so many times that I just want to put it down because the weight of it at times is heavy. And there's times where, honestly, I, I'm, maybe it's just getting tired of, of trying to follow Jesus and keep up. And instead of, of just dropping it for a moment and panting and realizing that Jesus says, Adrian, you can cast your burdens and your cares on me. I can take them. I drop it and I just leave it there for a while. And before you know it, a day turns into a week, a week turns into a month, a month turns into years. And before you know it, people have truly backslidden in their relationship with God. 
Self-denial is, is an attribute of somebody who ha has had an encounter with Christ. This dying to self, this, this notion that says, I want to do this, but this is more important. We recently took our kids on a trip to King's Dominion, and I'm, I'm learning that our oldest daughter is, is starting to come out of her shell with regards to fear. And one of the things that, I don't know if it was a premonition or a prophecy that hit me at King's Dominion, but I'm looking at the roller coasters, and I, I do not like riding roller coasters at all. I am scared to death of riding the roller coasters that go real high. And what I'm learning is my daughter, Harper, she's going to be on them. And you know who she's going to want to ride with her on them? Yeah. And so I, even now, she's six, and I'm preparing my mind and my heart for, okay, uh, I, I, I probably can't tell her no, and I'll do it. Why? Because that's my daughter, and my daughter wants me to do this. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go, and I'm going to bite the bullet, and I, I'm going to wear the pins, and I'm going to do those things that gets me on the roller coaster and, and do what she wants me to do. Why? Because I love her. There are times where we see Christ working, and we have to deny ourselves. We have to deny what it is that we want and grab hold of Christ, not with one hand and one hand on the world, because you will always choose the world. You have to have both hands on Christ. Self-denial is the first one. The second one is, is a servant's heart. You are most like Christ. And guys, you will hear me tell you this and, and have told you this so much. You are most like Christ when you're serving other people. Jesus came and, and said that it's, it's the last that will be first. Jesus said, I, I've come not to be served, but to what? Do you remember what he said? To serve. People who have had an encounter with Christ, I mean, they have a servant's heart. There is nothing that is, uh, is beneath them to do. There, there is nothing that they would say, you know, I, that's just not my calling. And what they're really saying is, I just don't want to do that. An encounter with Christ would also be an absolute surrender. People who would say, I'm giving this up. This looks a little bit different than, than dying to yourself. Absolute surrender means that you have control, but, but you're, you're willingly laying that down. You're, you're willingly lifting up the white flag of your life and saying, Jesus, I'm here and, and my life is yours. I recognize that it came from you anyway, but I'm, I'm trusting you with it. Those are three that I see in Scripture right off the bat. But then there's two in Andrew's life that I see. And this is what I wanted to focus on this morning. The first one is this. A genuine encounter with Christ is going to produce a desire to tell other people. Much like a gift you get someone, much like something you do, much like telling your kid it's a secret and then blurting it out, if you have encountered Jesus Christ and he has changed your life and you are trusting him with your salvation, there is this desire to tell other people. If you read verses 40 and 41, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. And notice what it says. Scripture is so clear that it points out the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. Andrew wasn't told to go tell your brother. Andrew didn't wait until the next day and say, hey, um, you know, I know we were supposed to hang out yesterday, but actually, do you know who I met? Do you know who I hung out with? No, it tells us the first thing Andrew did was that he goes and he tells his brother, we have found the Messiah. I, I liken this to a story in 2 Kings chapter 7. I want to read this for you because I see in this story the church today and you and me. In 2 Kings 7, it says it happened that four lepers were sitting just outside the city gate. So if you want to imagine Nightdale, this would be right after you cross the noose, before you get to the town of Nightdale sign, sitting right outside the city gate. They said to one another, what are we doing sitting here at death's door? If we enter the famine-struck city, we'll die. If we stay here, we'll die. So let's take our chances in the camp of Aram and throw ourselves on their mercy. If they receive us, we'll live. If they kill us, we'll die. We have nothing to lose. 
So after the sun went down, they got up and went into the camp of Aram. When they got to the edge of camp, surprise, there was not a man in the camp. The master, talking about God, had made the army of Aram hear the sound of horses and a mighty army on the march. They told one another, the king of Israel hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egypt to attack us. Panicked, they ran for their lives through the darkness, abandoning tents and horses and donkeys, the whole camp just as it was, running for dear life. These four lepers entered the camp and went into a tent. First they ate and drank, then they grabbed silver, gold, and clothing and went off and hid it. They came back, entered another tent, and looted it, again hiding their plunder. And finally they said to one another, we shouldn't be doing this. This is a day of good news, and we're making it into a private party. If we wait around until morning, we'll get caught and be punished. Come on, let's go tell the news to the king's palace. The, the, the story goes that Aram, which is modern-day Syria, was ready to sack the Israelites. And these lepers who, who were infected with leprosy, they could not go in the city gates because they were contagious. And so they were being left out of the city gates to die. And they came to the conclusion, either we go into the city gates and they kill us because we're lepers, or we wait out here and we die anyway. So let's just take our chances and go to the army of Aram, to the Syrians. Maybe they'll take us in. And they all agree to it. They agree to go off to the enemy, to go off to the world, if you will. And they go, and, and as soon as they get there, they find that God had worked his master plan as he always does. And that the people of Aram, the soldiers of Aram, weren't even there. God had caused them to have this panic. They began hearing noises, and they thought that the king of Israel had hired the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians, and they began to take off. And they were so panicked that they left everything just as it was. And the Bible tells us that these, these lepers come in and they begin to loot the place. And quickly come to the realization that this is too good to keep to themselves. They had to go and tell. They were looting, they were eating and drinking, they were taking the silver and the gold. And they come to this conclusion that this isn't right. We've got to tell people about what's happening. I think about that, and, and I wonder who spoke to them? Who spoke to them while they were in the tent? Who spoke to them while they're there and they're, they're feasting on all the stuff that the Aramites left behind? Who told them, who spoke to them when they're pocketing the silver and the gold? Maybe it was the voice of God. Maybe it was that still, small voice that tells us, you can look at all the things in this world, but until you have me, you're not going to be satisfied. When you have an encounter with Christ, you can't keep it to yourself. You, you have to tell other people. So many of you guys walked with us in, in those early months with Graham when, right after he was born. We had people at the hospital, our, my colleagues there, Shoshana's workforce. We had our, our other pastors. We had so many people walking with us through that time, and even now people will ask questions, and I always preface it with this. I don't use the word miracle a lot, and you may have even heard me tell you this. I don't use the word miracle a lot, but it feels like in Graham's life, those first two months, as touch and go as it was, that his little life is a miracle to me, and I, I can't keep that quiet. There are times when you have an encounter with something or someone, and you, you have to let everyone know People are trying to fill their lives with so many things, and yet the one thing that could bring them fulfillment, the one thing that could bring them life abundantly is the very thing the church is holding on to. What has God done in your life that you're sitting on? Did he wake you up this morning? Did he answer a prayer in your life? Did he meet a need in your life? Did he make a way in your life? What has he done in your life that you're sitting on that you need to be telling people? What are the things that you're feasting on this morning that God opened up a way and man, you're just reveling in it right now and he's telling you, you need to go share this with people because in your sharing, they're going to hear the good things that I've done. The Bible tells us in Matthew, let your light shine before men 
that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Not you, but your Father. Go tell people the good stuff that God is doing in your life. Not so that you can look and say, wow, what a blessed person I am, and look how good I have it, but to tell them how good you're, the God that you serve is. A, a genuine encounter with Christ will lead to, to testimony. It will lead to being willing and wanting to testify. The second one is this, a genuine encounter with Christ will lead to contentment. I, I do find it interesting that Andrew is not mentioned very much in Scripture. And, and I, I wonder if he was the guy who was okay being in the background. You know, I did my job. I, I was supposed to go and tell. I went and told my brother. We know another example in Scripture where he brought someone else. I mean, you think about Andrew's life. What, what, what do we know about it? All we really know is that he introduced Peter to Jesus. In John 12, he was one of the disciples that introduced some Greek men to Jesus. He was one of the disciples who asked about his second coming. But that's it. Outside of that, we don't know much. And, and I look at that and I think, well, what does that tell me? There's that old adage of it's amazing what organizations, and I would even say churches, can get done if you don't care who gets the credit. And, and sadly, in organizations today, and maybe even in the church, there are people wanting prominence and priority and, and wanting to, to feel and be the person or, or be seen as this or be seen as that, and they're longing to fill their life with, with status. And the reality is status doesn't help you. There's people who maybe you know who will do anything and say anything and do anything to anyone at work to get where they want to be, all to fulfill something that Jesus Christ could fulfill in them. Let me remind you of something that Jesus said. Whoever will be great among you shall be your servant. And whoever is the chief of that will be the greatest servant of all. My question to you this morning is, do you want to encounter Christ? Inasmuch as, as we all carry different crosses, our encounters all look very different. John the Baptist encountered Christ when he baptized him to fulfill a promise. Nathaniel encountered Jesus just doing what he had been doing on an afternoon. Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus. Andrew encountered Jesus when John the Baptist recognized who Jesus was and said, Behold, it's the Messiah, the, the Passover lamb. Jesus turns to Andrew and he asks him a question. And, and I, I wanted to use the message translation for this because this is how we're going to end this morning. And it's the question that I think Jesus Christ is asking each and every one of us. And it's this. What are you after? What are you after? My, my question to you is, is your answer Jesus? The sad thing is there are people who have been after so many things in their life. And innocently enough, Jesus might not make it on the list. For those of you who are following Christ, when was the last time you seriously considered why you followed him? When was the last time you, you took time to say, you know, there are so many things in life that I could be doing. Why am I following Jesus? Because the problem is, is if we don't stop to think about that, we slip in a routine. And what routines teach us is at some point there's something that's missing. And it just becomes something we do time and time again. When was the last time you thought about that? Remember the story in 2 Kings, the lepers who go in and, and find everything? Most people in the world are living in Samaria. They're, they're, they're living outside the city gates. They're, they're living out not knowing what's going to happen. They're starving to death, not, not physically but spiritually. I would tell you that the church is a place full of lepers, a hospital for the sick, people whose lives aren't together, but people who have stumbled into this tent where they have found a surplus of wealth, a surplus of things to eat, a surplus of things that bring their life joy, and they are all tied up in Jesus Christ. 
and friends, we will either be a church that chooses to stay in the tent and keep it to ourselves to say, hey, let's, let's, let's keep eating, let's, let's, let's hide this stuff, or we will be a church that takes it out and says, we can't keep it to ourselves. And the way that happens is through each and every one of us. According to tradition, Andrew took the gospel after the ascension of Christ into what is modern-day Russia. The disciples all spread out throughout Europe and Asia and carried the gospel to those places. Andrew went east and, according to history, uh, was martyred for his faith, was crucified on an X-shaped cross because he, too, did not feel he was worthy to be crucified like Christ. It's interesting that when they crucified him, they didn't pierce his hands or his feet. They used rope to tie him up to just let him hang as an example of what would happen if you follow Christ. There are times in our lives where if we choose Jesus, we have to be willing to lay it down. And unfortunately, I think the church today, there are a lot of people who will say, I'll, I'll choose Jesus, but they've not thought about it enough. They've not considered what it means. And, and when things get tough or other priorities sleep, creep in or something else looks glamorous for a time that grabs their attention, man, they don't consider the cost. And Jesus moves down the priority list. Do you want to have an encounter with him? Because if you do, it will change your life. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father, we, we sing songs of wanting to be in your presence. We even sang a song this morning of, of asking you to come. And Father, there's, there's times when we look at this world and, and we see the chaos, we see the uncertainty, we see reasons to be fearful. And so, God, the, the prospect of you coming and restoring order and establishing your, your kingdom Lord, in so many ways, there are times where we want to see that, where we want to be rescued. Lord, I, I realize that there's been a day and time appointed for that already. Lord, my prayer this morning is in the day-to-day -day lives that we live. For the times where our, our priorities and our schedules and our devotions and affections aren't what they should be. For those times where we, we see you working and rather than sharing it, we, we, we keep it to ourselves. For those times that we feel you speaking to our heart and, and trying to convince us that the longings of our heart can be satisfied in you and yet, Father, we pour so many other things into our heart to try and fill it. Father, I, I pray that as you look upon your church today, that you might help us understand what it means to have an encounter with you. And Father, that we would be honest enough and bold enough to, to either pursue that or, or to step back until, until we really want you. Lord, you make it very clear in Scripture that a choice has to be made. So God, my, my prayer this morning is that if, if we have made that choice to follow you, if we have made that choice to be baptized in you, if we have made that choice to trust you, God, 
God, that that would reign supreme in our life. And that our fidelity, our devotion to you would be to you alone. Father, it's not at the exclusion of other things. But Lord, it is recognizing that you are the head. And that everything else falls in line behind that. Lord, forgive us for those times where we have not allowed you to be the head of the church. Forgive us for those times where we have not allowed you to be the head of our family, the head of our ambition, the head of our work. And Father, as you speak to us individually this morning, may the response of our heart be one of placing you in, in your rightful place, on your throne, on the seat of our heart that all of our affection, all of our love might be given to you. Lord, we pray all of these things in Christ's name. And all of God's people said, Amen. I want to invite our praise team to make their way back up. And as we think about a response to God's word this morning, I want, to, I want to ask you that question. Do you want to encounter Jesus? You, you may be here, and the reality is you, you've never had a relationship with Christ. Maybe, maybe you've lived your parents' faith for so long, but it, it never became your decision. It was something that you, you, you just, you're just doing. Will you choose him today? You may be here and... and I think all of us fall into this at times where our, our priorities are just not what they should be. If you feel God speaking to you, are, are you willing to let him work on your heart? And I, I get that it might be painful. I get that it might open up things for you. But my goodness, the, the, the results of it, you, you, you will be blessed letting God reorganize your heart. If you feel like you'd like someone to pray with you, I'll, I'll be right here. I would love to do that. There's people in this church that if you know them and you feel like you just want to go sit beside them and ask them to pray for you, feel free to make that move right now. However God is speaking to you, I, I want to invite you to respond. Not, not for anyone else's well-being except for your own. That you and the Lord might reconcile whatever it is that's missing there. Would you stand and we'll sing together. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come again to claim your own Come to reap what you have sown All creation weeps and groans for you It's to you that we belong It's to you we lift our song How our spirits look and long for you Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Like a thief in dead of night, come my everlasting light. Let your brilliance shame the brightest day. With your voice like endless seas, 
Bending swords and stars and keys Bring the nations to their knees We pray Come Lord Jesus, come Come Lord Jesus, come Though fitful is our flame, you are age to age the same. Jesus, faithful is your name and true. So until the sun does rise, till your trumpets ring the skies, help us keep our restless eyes on you. Come, Lord Jesus. Well, as a reminder, uh, we are no longer taking up offering on Sunday morning. The offering boxes are located in the back. Uh, if you're visiting with us today, I hope that you will not feel compelled to contribute in any way. Uh, in the bulletin is a Connect card. We'd love to know a little bit about you, if you're comfortable sharing that with us. And if you have any prayer concerns, you can also share those on that card. We'll have a, a team of people that are willing to be praying for your needs, whatever they are this week. You can drop those in the offering box as well. Just a couple of announcements with you, and I'm going to go ahead and invite Bill Powell to start making his way up to give us our benediction this morning. Um, Operation Christmas Child, we've been collecting items each month for a, a, a shoebox packing that we will be doing at the end of the year. Uh, for July, it's children's clothing items, and there is a, a box out in the lobby where you can drop those items off. We are doing a backpack drive. Our hope is to get at least 30 backpacks. That's enough to fill a whole classroom of, of needs at Nightdale Elementary. So that is going to be starting July 23rd. If you want to start bringing those items now, if you're out shopping, you can drop those off in the lobby at the Connect tables. We will definitely keep them there. And it's, it's, every year it is so wonderful to go to Nightdale Elementary, drop these things off, and to see kids who otherwise would not going to start the school year off with supplies and just the the humiliation that can come with not having a backpack, not having pencils, not having paper that kids can feel, and, and to know that we can have a hand in helping meet that. So if that is something that you'd like to be a part of, please help us with that. Two more things, and they both involve life groups. If you are a life group host or have committed to being a core group member, July the 30th, that is a Sunday night, we're going to be meeting here at church to talk about the, the beginning stages of that. And then secondly, if you're here and you're, you're wanting more information or you say, you know what, sign me up because we're going to be doing this connection event in August and we're going to be sending out invitations for that, you could text in your bulletin to this number. It is 647-4004, area code 919, and text the word together and that will add you to a list. Right now we've got I believe five life group locations and just really excited for what this ministry is going to be. It's much different than small groups and it really is going to foster not only deeper relationships with one another, but I hope more importantly a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Groups are going to be how we connect with one another here at Northside. We'd love for you to be a part of this inaugural group as it gets started. I hope it has been wonderful to be gathered as a church this morning. Remember your church family. Summer is a time where people are coming and, and going. Our church is not without people who are dealing with needs in their life. And as you 
pray this week. Be remembering the Pritchett family uh, in your prayers. Continue to remember Brandon and Rachel Barnes. Continue to remember Sean Simpson as he's going to be soon finishing up his missions trip in Florida. Be remembering our trip that folks that are going on a summer mission to Arizona. Be remembering your church as we look at expansion between the community space and the children's ministries. There is not a shortage of things to be praying for. Amen? Yes. Amen. Bill, would you close us out? Let us stand together and receive the benediction. As Adrian spoke this morning, I was reminded of a person who lost a coin and swept her house until she found it and then called her friends together to celebrate. I was reminded of a man who lost one sheep and left 99 out so the wolves could eat it and went and got the one and brought it back. I'm reminded of what Martin Luther said. We are mere beggars who know where to buy bread and where to get bread and we're out telling others how to find those bread. Lord, help us today to so receive your Holy Spirit that we may be filled with the bread of life and that we may go as beggars and tell other beggars where they can find bread. Lord, be with us this week, we pray. Amen. Morning. Let's stand and sing together. Praise his name forever.